Hello, Suricata friends. My name is Anton Turin. Uh, I'm head of attack detection team at Positive Technologies, Russia. Today we're going to talk about uh, how to detect malicious communications if they're encrypted with help of Suricata. I'm responsible for detecting network attacks and uh, uh, important part of my everyday job is doing threat hunting in clients' infrastructure. And to successfully achieve our goals, we are developing Suricata rules. Now there are more than 4,000 uh, and a uh, small amount of these of them for most significant uh, vulnerabilities or attacks we are publishing in our Twitter account. Um, when deciding which malware to discuss, I wanted to make things interesting, so I picked two remote access tools. These threads are hard to detect on the network because they are using encryption to evade uh, content-based detection. The first one is Rimkus, uh, which was widely used in campaigns targeted, targeting defense contractors in Tokyo this summer. Rimkus encrypts all data in TCP packets from the end to end with a key uh, set by attacker at build time. Therefore, it doesn't have any unchanging uh, content that could be used to create a long-lasting detection rule. The second thread we will look at is Adwind which uses TLS encryption with a self-signed certificate. It was discovered in 2013 and still being used in different targeted campaigns. Edwin certificates can be modified to neutralize existing detection rules. However, we have been able to detect uh, its network activity based on the method I'm going to present today. Several rules for Edwin have already been included in the ET Open rule set. When rule developers see encrypted traffic, what's their first reaction? They see a weird flow of bytes, frown, and say, to hell with it. The most persistent ones take a few samples, look at the protocol, and try to write rules based on content, usually unsuccessful. The most uh, tenacious and inquisitive minds of all uh, comes here to Suricon to find a new way uh, <laughs> to detect malware and encrypted connections. <laughs> Heads off to you guys. And as we were the Suricata Consortium members, uh, we started looking for a solution based on Suricata. Here is what we did next. We have a large uh, collection of malware samples, which is constantly updated. We divide these samples into families using a special classification algorithm. For this, we use executable files, YARA rules, and a special fuzzy hashing algorithm that takes into account only network traffic. We use this method to assess traffic if we can decrypt it. Our goal is to develop a detection rule that fits the entire family while minimizing false positives. Uh, let's now take a look um, uh, of, at how the traffic of a single sample uh, may appear in uh, stream form. The stream consists of packets. In our example, the client sends packets of different lengths to the server. Uh, and server replies with the same confirmation every time. When we analyzed the rules uh, we had written for detecting such uh, stream in the traffic, we had an insight that um, the packets uh, could be described as uh, Cartesian coordinates. Take a look. The x-axis uh, reflect the amount of data transmitted in the stream, while the y-axis shows the number of bytes in packet payload. So now we can visualize the stream, uh, which you can see on the right side of the slide. These coordinates are interrelated. The bar for packet 1 fills the space equal to the packet length in the stream, while the bar for packet 2 is moved uh, to the right along the x-axis uh, by a distance equal to its length, starting from where the packet 1 ends, and so on. This is how the client stream of one sample looked. Now let's consider several samples uh, within one family. We played different samples in a sandbox and uh, got a large number of streams. This is what the stream graph looks like. Squares are packets, each color for each sample. At the first, uh, all the first packets are in the section one, the second packets uh, in the section two, and so on. As you see, uh, the coordinates on the graph vary because of the different packet lengths. This is our way of showing that in real stream, 
uh, packets uh, payloads uh, even within a single family may have different lengths. This may happen because different systems are infected and during the registration phase the server receives uh, different amounts of information about uh, compromised host. Variation can also be caused by a modification of server commands during malware compilation. In any case, we can limit these uh, color squares, I mean packets, uh, to a certain area by setting boundaries, which are based on position in the stream and packet size. We found that it's best to detect uh, the beginning of the stream, uh, because if we decide to detect, for example, packet number 100 uh, of different samples within the same family, the allocation of that packet in each stream will be very different. Differences in all previous packets add up, so we have to set extremely wide boundaries uh, to describe where to catch packet number 100. As a result, we could uh, likely get false positives. The, uh, these areas may overlap or splint uh, into several areas among the y-axis. We could just uh, combine everything into one really large area and not bother describing the smaller ones, but we would run into the risk of false positives. So the smaller we can make these areas, the more precisely they reflect the real situation in the stream, which makes detection more accurate and reliable. Our task is to find packets with the smallest difference in lengths. Let's assume we need to detect packet uh, number two in different samples, and its size is either 100 plus minus 20 bytes or 300 plus minus 20 bytes. In this case, it makes sense to create two separate areas instead of one uh, large. And detection will follow one of these two paths upward or downward. Let's now consider what tools Suricata gives us to define such areas in rules. We will need two keywords, dsize and stream size. If we are looking for a packet from 200 to 600 bytes, located somewhere between uh, 1024th and uh, 2048th byte of the stream, the rule will look like this. This dsize keyword sets a range of packet length values using the less than and greater than signs at one place, and the stream is set with two keywords. The first keyword limits the position of the stream, the packet in the stream from the left, and the second keyword limits uh, it from the right. Guys, as far as I know, um, uh, the practical rule development uh, training was sold out, and uh, could you please tell me how to create um, detection rules uh, to detect a sequence of packets? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> flow bits. By combining them uh, into a chain uh, with the flow bits. Suricat uh, processes uh, packets with the rules and uh, uh, sets a certain, a certain flow bit in the stream uh, if at least one packet in it matches the conditions. In the first rule, we have set uh, flow bit number one and uh, no, no alert action. To continue detection, there must be a rule that sets another flow bit when checking a packet. For example, we set a flow bit in the first rule. When the second rule triggers, it checks the, the first flow bit, sets its own, uh, unsetting the previous one, and uh, the action is still no alert. When we finally reach the last rule in this chain, all the flow bits have been passed, and an alert can be generated. Just one alert for entire stream. Less noise, more precision. Now let's consider the real case uh, of the Ramcos remote access tool. This thread encrypts the entire packet payload, so there is no way to create robust detection uh, based on content only. Uh, here you can see uh, diagrams of the server and client streams, commands, and their size in bytes. On the right you can see real decrypted data from the packets. Each packet is headed by the magic bytes data stat, and the uh, packet body contains the CMD separator. We use payload sizes and data fragments from a real sample to better understand the sequence of data in typical connection. Take a look at the first client packet and the server response. The first packet is always large as it contains information about infected system. 
The second one is small because it contains only a server acknowledgement. To detect connections uh, by this family, we need five rules because we have to look at multiple packets, not just a single one. We use the first rule to track information about an infected client. To do this, we set the server stream size to one, which means that the server doesn't transmit anything, and the packet with client data is the first one in our stream. The second rule is the needle's eye, because it takes packets with variation in lengths of only 10 bytes. This can be explained by the lengths of server commands between 26 and 34 bytes. So this second rule does uh, the most of weeding out of false positives. We can set such a narrow length or uh, such a narrow range of lengths uh, thanks to the behavior of the server. When a client sends uh, the command to add a new host and information about the system, the server sends only a small heartbeat to the client. As for the flow bits, what we do is quite simple. We set flow bit in the first rule, then in the second uh, one we check it and then set, set a new one, and continue down the chain until we reach the last flow bit. And only then we do generate an alert. By the way, we frequently combine this method with uh, content-based detection when we don't have enough fixed data to eliminate false positives. This method also works to detect other malware that encrypts TCP packet payloads, such as Topsy, Bayrobe, and Virut. You can find all uh, the details for, uh, for them in the rule set, to which I will give a link at the end of the presentation. The next thread uh, we are going to discuss is Edwind, also known as uh, AlienSpy, JRAT, uh, JSocket, which is still widely used and um, even distributed through the malware as a service platform. Here, client and server send each other serialized Java objects. The first two packets contain magic bytes, which are uh, the first few bytes of any serialized uh, Java stream. This is, by the way, the feature of the malware, as first packets and all connections are always B4 bytes long. Then come client data, followed by short server replies. Everything would be just fine if these connections were not being secured by TLS. According to TLS RFC, application data is on the record layer. It has several default fields, such as type, version, and the TLS ciphertext fragment length. Edwin works with TLS version later than 1.0, also, also we will have an initialization vector. This malware uses only the cipher blockchain mode of AES encryption algorithm. As the plain text are aligned to match the size of encryption block, 16 bytes, the data will be padded <coughs> to that size, we call it quantized, uh, to reach the certain output value. One quantization step equals to the block size. Let's look at the graph. Here is a coordinate plane, as we did for encrypted custom TCP protocols. The y-axis reflects the number of bytes in the TLS protocol fragments, while the x-axis shows the number of unencrypted data that need to be transmitted. As you can see, the graph is stair-step. This is what we mean by quantization. Rounding and truncation are typical examples of quantization process. Uh, one step equals to block size, which is 16 bytes. This graph starts at 64 bytes on y-axis because HMAC uh, with the SHA-384 uh, hashing algorithm is uh, 48 bytes and um, initialization vector is 16 bytes, so the sum is exactly 64. Now let's get back to Edwind and see how the data size is changed uh, after the alignment and arrangement at the TLS record layer. The first short packets contain data that need only one block of ciphertext. Thus, a TLS fragment is 80 bytes long, that is 16 bytes IV, uh, 48 bytes HMAC, which is uh, 64, plus 4 bytes of data, and 12 bytes of padding, which are encrypted together. As you can see, the structure of client-server communications uh, has not been changed. It's just that blocks, lengths, have been quantized, uh, and detection of these lengths will be somewhat different from what we did uh, with Remcos and TCP. Let's see which keywords we will need for detection rules. TLS detection rules include content, byte test, and stream size keywords. 
We use content to find the application data and not the records of any other type. This is byte 17, while uh, all three is the most significant byte of the TLS version. The next two bytes are the fragment length. We use uh, byte test keyword to match the required range of fragment lengths. For example, if we inspect a packet and see the value 1703, while the, the fragment size is between 900 and um, 1104 bytes, and this fragment fits uh, in the appropriate range of client and server streams, then the rule will trigger and sets a flow bit. As you see, it's rather convenient to use uh, byte test instead of D size to match a payload length while working with TLS. Here is our lovely graph for the Edwind. Uh, by the way, if you want to, to find the certain length of uh, data that you need to match and not a range, you can use the content keyword to match uh, the size, but notice that keywords, uh, that content keyword use the hex values and the byte test use dex. And flow bits. For detection, we only need to check the first few bytes at the beginning of each packet in the stream. It's important as Suricata imposes a restriction for the length of the buffer in which the TLS stream is stored. As for detection with TCP, there are restrictions to the stream length and packet size, but we never encountered, encountered them uh, in, in our practice. In case of contentless rules, Suricata has to inspect the parameters of all packets without multi-pattern matching, uh, AMPM. And for TLS, there is an additional restriction uh, that it doesn't be uh, inspected by default. We can eliminate this restriction um, with a specific setting in suricata.yaml configuration file. As you can see, it is uh, possible and, by the way, very interesting to detect encrypted malware communication using Suricata. I uh, hope that after this talk you will be able to develop your very own rules. Uh, and uh, as examples, we pushed uh, our special rules to attack detection repo. I'll be here at Suricon for the whole three days. Uh, please feel free to ask me any questions and suggest your ideas about uh, de detecting malware and its encryption communications. Uh, and that's all, folks. Thanks for your attention.